or go to rocketmortgage.com. Racial approval only valid on certain 30-year fixed rate loans. Call for cost information and conditions. Equal housing lender. License in all 50 states. NMLS number 3030. Additional conditions or exclusions may apply. It's time to join the millions of people using Zoom video conferencing. Turn any size conference room, huddle room, or executive office into a Zoom room with flawless HD video, crystal clear audio, and instant wireless sharing. It'll even work with your existing hardware. Start your meetings with a single touch or use Zoom's new voice command feature. Hey, Zoom, start meeting. Huddle happy. Visit zoom.us to set up your free Zoom room trial today. That's zoom.us. Zoom video conferencing. The following program is a paid presentation. The views and or opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect those of the staff and management of KWAM. Religion, science, myths and legends all point toward the next evolution in human consciousness. What do the invisible realms hold? Who's telling us and how do they know? We are investigating insights from around the world to answer the question, what does the material world arise out of and where do we go once we've dropped the body? You're about to go interdimensional with Robert Wallace and Adam Jeffries to Undiscovered Spiritual Realities. You're about to get your orthodox cages rattled because the day of glib religiosity is over. <laughs> Welcome to Spiritual Realities. I'm Robert Wallace here with Adam Jeffrey. And uh, today we're going to be talking about Ho'oponopono, the sacred prayer of the Hawaiian people, what it is and how you can start to use it to clean your soul, come back into harmony with Mother Gaia, the soul of the earth, who is the Christ. We'll talk about Freemasonry and Kabbalah, whether or not we should, secret societies, what they're teaching, and why it's a secret. Uh, if we have time, we'll talk about Emanuel Swedenborg. He's a scholar, inventor, spiritual explorer. And he spent decades in heaven and hell talking with angels and demons while still alive in the body here on earth. What can we know about those worlds based on his writings? We'll go into that. And finally, the most exciting part of today's show is... Uh, We'll be talking with a man named Elitam Elamin. He is a breatharian and has been for the last 19 years. Uh, I'm going to talk about my journey starting uh, down that path, what's happened to me and where I'm at. And uh, we'll talk to him and get some spiritual guidance that we can all use. So how's your week been, Adam? It's been great. Awesome. Yeah, it's been great. Well, I don't want to spend a lot of time in niceties because we got some good stuff to talk about. Cool. Let's Let's dig in. Ho'oponopono. Have you heard of it? Never heard of it until right now. Just now. <laughs> awesome. Ho'oponopono is a, a part of Hawaiian, uh, I don't know if we'd call it Hawaiian mysticism, but Hawaiian spiritual practice uh, that really comes around the simple prayer that allows a person to kind of clean their karma and to realign themselves spiritually. Cool. And so it's a very simple kind of four-step process that I think everybody of every religion will recognize. And it goes, I love you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. And this is a very simple prayer that if we're reflecting on uh, our transgressions is basically how you'd repent of any sin. Absolutely. And so it's a really great mantra too to kind of keep ourselves continuously in the state of repentance. Yeah, it's beautiful. It is very beautiful. Yeah. I'm glad we could share that with people. And in the future, we'll have uh, some practitioners of Ho'oponopono on uh, yeah. who I've talked to in the past who can elaborate a bit more on that. Sure. Um, do we have anything like that in Christianity or anywhere else where such an important gesture as repentance like that has been kind of boiled down to so few lines so succinctly i'm not familiar with anything quite that brief um I, you know obviously that what, what's called the lord's prayer which mm -hmm. was really jesus's prayer our father yes. in heaven holy is your name hallowed be thy name however people want to say right. that you know you know there, there's the essence of repentance in that there's the essence of dependence um and and recognizing the separateness of God and yet the dependence and interdependence uh, that happens in that relationship. So I, I would think that's the, the first thing that comes to my mind is obvious. It's a pretty universal among Christians of all denominations is to, I think, pray that prayer. So Yeah. yeah. There was a, a book written by uh, Dr. Joe Vitale, who was in The Secret, 
anybody's ever seen The Secret. Oh, yeah. And he wrote a, a book called, I think it's called Going Zero or Zero Point, something like that. And in it, he discusses Ho'oponopono and uh, as taught by uh, Dr. Hugh Len, who is a Hawaiian metaphysician, and, uh, and basically describing how we can use this process to cleanse ourselves and our environment of karmic forces, spiritual you know, entities, you know, negative forces. Very and cool. Really let the light back in. Okay. Love it. Yeah. I like that. I love that too. Uh, I'm going to move right along though, because that was a very simple point I wanted to make. But I think this whole thing on Freemasonry and Kabbalah, that one, we can tap into that for a second. You don't know much about Freemasonry or Kabbalah? Z practically zero. We probably I, have. I find it intriguing, you yeah. know. I've been in conversations about it, and but but most of the people I've ever talked to about it, they don't really know anything about it. You know, they it, it's mysterious. It's mm -hmm. uh, are there conspiracies? You know, what's going on? You know, all, all of that stuff is out there. So, but really, what do I know about it? Zero. <laughs> well, I'm just going to put a little uh, bug in the ear of our listeners. So anybody who's curious to investigate these matters. I know I was first introduced to the Freemasonry subject in a kind of a negative light, you know. Sure. Like you said, it's conspiracies and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then uh, after years of investigation, I actually got tied up with some Masons. Cool. I found out how to become a Mason. Mm -hmm. I did that. And I found that it is actually a, a very profound spiritual path. And uh, something that is uh, a lot of the details are seem to be hidden from the world, but uh, it is something that you know can be studied. Information can be gotten at the library online about it. Uh, but it's kind of like Kabbalah in that sense, and Kabbalah is actually part of the uh, free Masonic teaching. Interesting. And I want to just make a point about it because I think it's valuable to consider it. Uh, Freemasonry and Kabbalah in light of kind of like a uh, schematic of the brain uh, with circuitry. Um, and right now we're in a very closed system of thought. We're repeating the same thoughts that we thought yesterday or things that we've learned since childhood. We're working in a vacuum in our head right. based on what we've acquired in this life. Unless we have attained, you know, some spiritual knowledge, we can work in there to help us break out of that paradigm sure and with kabbalah and freemasonry which freemasonry works in degrees and kabbalah works in uh basically uh degrees or paths and each of these points on the tree of life as it's called uh represent a different part of our psychology relating to our lower being or our higher being and these pathways that come between all have different meanings, too. So they're called the seraphith, which are these round circles uh, on this tree of life diagram that you'll see if you've ever seen it before, if you'd look it up. And then these uh, 33 pathways that connect all of these, they all represent different attainments of various kinds of states of consciousness. So there's different kinds of uh planets and zodiacs attached to them, different kinds of correspondence in the physical, but there's spiritual lessons, very specific spiritual lessons attached to each one of these. And the idea is if you can come to an understanding of all these paths perfectly, you'll flip the switch and activate this grand synapse in the head that basically produces enlightenment. Wow. Yeah. So you're setting up the infrastructure by learning all of this details, this whole library of information, and filing it away in these different categories, you're setting yourself up to eventually cognite and connect all the dots at once in one grand enlightenment. Wow. That's, that? that's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And when I've had it explained to me kind of like that, it makes a lot more sense. Because otherwise, it, does, it seems yeah. like a very convoluted set of a lot of information yeah. and history and stuff. And then what does it connect to? You just learn it and then you know. Right, right. So so from what you say, it really seems or feels like it's, it's a very um, linear path toward enlightenment. Whereas a lot of times when, it, when you're um, 
when you're meditating and you're praying and stuff, things feel a little more abstract. You know, it's like, hey, I, I'm not really sure that there is a set particular path, but this is more of a, again, I guess kind of a linear, um, here are some steps um, yeah. that, that lead directly to enlightenment. And that, that's, yeah. what, that's what it sounds like, yeah. I think, if I'm interpreting that correctly. Yeah, it's not unlike uh, Freemasonry, not unlike even Scientology. They have codified the steps that a person spiritually need to confront, overcome, and master in order for psychic, spiritual clairvoyance, and most importantly, spiritual initiation into these higher dimensions uh, for them to occur. So I just want to put that out there because uh, if we don't know anything about these subjects, we may just brush them off. But if any of that appeals having kind of a codified system, you might decide to look into them. Kabbalah comes from Jewish mysticism. It I used... have heard that before. Yeah, I was familiar with that. Yeah, and it used to be practiced only, you were only allowed to be taught after you were 40 years old. Interesting. Now, I'm not 40 years old. And there's a lot of practices that we are advised to not get into until we're 40 years old. Hmm. But I don't care. And I don't think people who are really into this stuff can help themselves. <laughs> That's true, yeah, yeah. But there's a lot to say for the natural enlightenment that comes at the different stages as we get older. Oh, there's no question about that. I just just from experience, there there's a dramatic difference that's happened. I, I've I've been interested in spiritual realities and the ideas behind them for as pretty much as long as I can remember. But there there's no question that there are stages of development um that happen as as you get older. You know, it's just it's it's kind of mind boggling how intense they can be. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but I am over 40. I'll give my age away there. Good. I was wondering about that. <laughs> the, the gray hair gives me away. Yeah. I saw you glance at it. I didn't it. want to say anything. <laughs> I am a little jealous of people who have attained that age, but uh, I shouldn't run ahead of all the things I got to experience getting up to it. But I do know that, yeah, mantles of maturity kind of just get bestowed on you, whether or not you've been studying. And if you have been studying, then even more spiritual and great things are unfolded to this. Absolutely. And I, and I think maybe the, the biggest thing I've learned so far on my path is how much more I have to learn. Mm. You know, because in so many different points in my journey so far, I, I became closed-minded to things instantly. Oh, this is truth. Everything else is wrong. You know, and it's like that breaking free from those. It's like little bits, maybe you could call it of enlightenment, L little bits of enlightenment along the way that have said, okay, maybe there's truer truth. We talked about that a lot mm -hmm. last week. But, you know, um, at this point, I'm just wide open you know it's like i have a lot to learn i Absolutely. thought i knew everything and i yes. didn't at all <laughs> yes that's how i feel i feel so overwhelmed by how much there is to learn as soon as you're into one subject matter and you talk to somebody else they're talking about some other philosopher or some other school absolutely of you, like, you're you've been doing that to me just in the this past week <laughs> these ideas i'm like what what is this i've never even heard of this that's this is, great and at i home, love it it's cool yeah. at home in front of my bookcase you know i'm drowning with things that I want to study, but I'm just oh, sure you can do one at a time, you know, and, Man. uh, and the good thing to know is that they're all basically, if they're in alignment with, you know, true universal law, they're all basically teaching the same things. Absolutely. In a different language. So you don't have to worry in some sense, if really a person can master any one path, right. They'll come to understand all the rest. Yeah. So, but it is kind of a quest to gather all the aspects and the insights from all of the viewpoints. Right. To help, you know, really establish that. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, okay, so the next thing I want to talk about, because we are getting ready, I want to have Ellie Tom Elamine on here a little bit earlier than we might otherwise, because he's so profound, he's so awesome, and the more time he's talking and we're not, probably the better. So um, <laughs> I'm going to skip. I think Emmanuel Swedenborg is okay, would be okay if we waited till next week, but I want to talk about my breatharian journey real quick, and then we'll go to that interview with him. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, you probably heard of vegetarians, vegans. Uh, you've heard of maybe... <laughs> I've, heard, I've heard of that, yeah. Nutarians, fruitarians, <laughs> liquidarians. And finally, there's something called breatharian. Just as a quick note to the listeners, I don't mean to interrupt you, Robert, sorry, but as a quick note, I, I've been vegan 
for about a decade now. Yeah. Um, vegetarian first and then vegan. So that's that's why I had to make a joke that I've heard of vegetarian and vegan because my family and I are all vegan. So okay, uh, but breatharian is brand new to me. So I'm so intrigued. I can't wait to hear what what you have to say about that. In yeah, your journey. So so I will give a little bit of input on my background. I uh, heard about this about five years ago from a teacher named uh, Akai and Camille. They're uh, husband and wife step, and they had been uh, breatharian for a decade or so, teachers in the subject. And then in the last year or so, programs started coming out like, hey, you can do this from home. Wow. Now, apparently there was something out that's been out for 20, 30 years called Living on Light by Jazz Maheen. It's a book on something called the 21-day process. I didn't know about that. Uh, but I did find something called the eight day process that involved out of eight days, your first and your last day, you can eat like some salad or some soup. Your middle six days are fasting with no food. And then the middle three days of that is no food or water. So you're going three days, no food or water. That was a very <laughs> wow. intense process for me. Yeah. And in the process, you're also doing something called pranic breathing. So people say, well, where are you getting your nutrition from? You're getting it from the rarefied chronic filled sunlit ox oxygen air preferably while sun gazing grounding you know barefooted and doing these rhythmic pranic breathing uh applications in the process of this fasting converts the body in, so that you become a pranic being so you can start digesting and metabolizing prana in lieu of food and water so what happens is the one for sure <laughs> thing that happened is i lost hunger this is in Labor Day. I haven't felt hangry. I haven't felt hunger since Labor Day. That's not to say I haven't eaten because another, once that veil came up, which I thought was yeah. really coming up over a ghost, you know, saying, you know, if you're not hungry, then what's the problem? Well, under that, there is a problem because there's a psychological addiction to food that has nothing to do with the body's need for nutrition. Right. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. So uh, that's what... Ellie Tom will be talking about, and uh, all the breatharians will, you know, discuss that for people kind of on that path. And I'm curious to what he's going to advise for next steps. Oh, I can't wait. Go through the process again, <laughs> and this time, don't do it. You know, I am so excited about this. Don't yeah, say, yeah. So we will be back in a minute with uh, Ellie Tom. Cool. This gives me a whole new insight into fasting, you know, what it really means. Because I've practiced fasting many times, you know. So that's a good point. Yeah. Turn, push that up some more. Or you want it down? Yeah, that's better. Yeah, I'm fine with this. Okay. That was perfect. And I'm going to get, there we go. Oh, cool. Ellie Tom? Oh, let me turn you up. Hold on. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Okay. Thank you. We are on break.
All right, we're back on the air here. We have Eli Tom Elamin, son of Adam, in from Israel on the line. Hopefully, you can see him if you're joining us on Facebook Live. And uh, how you doing, Eli Tom? Oh, wonderful! I mean, I'm having a great time just living this life, being in existence. That's beautiful. Okay, and. <laughs> So you're in Israel right now, which means it's uh, 11.30 a.m. here right now, and it's what, 7.30 p.m.? It's Monday. Yes. Well, okay. it's actually it's Sunday evening. Oh, it's Sunday evening. Okay. Yes. That's right. So you're just at the nighttime over there. So uh, real briefly, I kind of gave a little bit of an introduction into uh, breatharianism, uh, what it consists of, and... Uh, and my journey, and I don't know how much you know about mine, I did do the eight-day process, Akai and Camille's right. process, and I did that over Labor Day. And uh, even though I'm not a food-free person, I have lost hunger. I have not felt hungry since Labor Day. And I have discovered, though, there's a shadow lurking in my intellect, in my astral body, that still has its addiction to food. And so... Now I'm kind of on another, a different battle. I'm, I'm repositioning myself. Can you tell us a little bit uh, about yourself, your journey, and maybe what are these first steps that a person goes through in converting? Oh, I'm glad you brought that up. Now, that realization, the first step of the process is actually when you can see that it ex can exist and you go into it. As soon as you get that thought to go into it and try it yourself, that actually changes how the body and the mind is behaving if you realize it or not. Because you cannot accomplish something if you cannot see yourself doing it. Yeah. Good so that's step number one. Step number two is you go into the process. This is actually a holistic health journey. What that means is it's a journey dealing with your health. That's why you're going into it. See, food or overeating or eating every day actually causes bad health. This is why this paradigm shift we're in now, more people are learning about fasting, more people are learning about uh, at least backing away from the table at periods of time and finding out that there's been better health improvements than trying to find a perfect diet or window of consumption. So when you start recognizing this, fasting is different than living on planet. So when I went into this journey, it started out due to health purposes. There was a time I was overweight, and I decided to do something about it. So when I started to lighten up my diet, I started to see health improvements. But what I didn't realize then, that my body started receiving more life force energy. That's what I'm going to use the term today. Life force energy starts going through the body with no hindrances, no blockages, and that improves the health. Now, keep this in mind, it's all dealing with energy flow. And you will be successful when you understand that your system of energy held together by thought, and also you're living in a system of energies surrounding us and all around us. Mm -hmm. So now it's about harmonizing these energies and becoming one with them so they can flow with no blockages. Uh -huh. Beautiful. Amazing. I think Amazing. Humanity, your thought process is in duality. Mm. Everybody's been affected by it. Absolutely. And duality puts you in a descending process in reality. To ascend, you have to start utilizing a unity consciousness. The more you become unified with nature, the more you can be self-sustaining. This making sense. Mm -hmm. oh, so this is, not, this is a lifestyle, but it begins on how we're thinking. Hmm. See, meditation is the foundation of living on planet. It ain't about just stop eating. Right. Why is that? Meditation is medication. When you truly know how to meditate, you are becoming one with your true self, hmm. one with the universe. One with the environment. And if you become one, the reason why you know you're living on more prana is because your old health ailments will heal themselves up. And the more you become healed, the more you become self-sustaining, 
one more creation because that's your true reality. Awesome. This is not far-fetched. It has to be manifested, and a person really has to utilize it to see these principles come to life. So this reminds me of the first thing that comes to mind is the density of our food is bringing down our thoughts, and the, the lighter we eat... Right. The more rarefied or the pranic energy, the the more rarefied our thoughts, I suppose, right? Exactly, because food is actually bringing you further into the duality of thought. Because first of all, you're believing that that's what keeps you alive, mm. and it doesn't. It separates you from unity. Mm. That's wow. beautiful point. Uh -oh. Wow. No, that's good. Wow. That's the stuff <laughs> we came for. <laughs> Yes. And in our languages, no matter what language you speak, all of them are supporting duality because mm -hmm. it splits things up into parts, division, and as soon as you start bringing that language to control your collective thought, now you're living in a duality reality. Mm -hmm. And that's why you start descending. You start becoming separated. Even though your body by its nature is already connected with the unified forces. The body doesn't lie. That is the true book. You don't need to read no more books. All the creation is already in you, all knowing. But we live in it, but you have to become one. This is the process. One with it again. So you have to start breaking away the things that are keeping you in a dual process. And one of them is food, because we can relate to it. So it's not about leaving it alone altogether. That's the problem people try to jump too fast. It's about backing up slowly to give your body and your mind time to become unified and become one again. You go too fast, it's your body's not prepared for it. Hmm. Yes. That That's, makes so much sense, yeah. I, and Akai tried to warn me. I was talking to him before I did it. He said, well, the first time you go through the process, you know, maybe don't do the dry fasting part. The dry fasting is with right. no water. And I said, I'm a superhero. I'm going to go for the whole thing. <laughs> and it was a very difficult thing. I probably would have done it all over again because I like to learn the hard way. Uh, but now that I'm through this and I'm listening back over the material, it makes a lot more sense uh, how that we have this other layer of this mental addiction portion that we have to get, get rid of. And so I wasn't really thinking too hard about that. Uh, would you mind discussing that a little bit? The um, I know I've I'm actually cutting you off from answering that question, so I'll just let you keep talking. <laughs> now listen to the key words we said. Now let me go back in the language because the language you were just using is real important. Now you're looking at the battle with your mental body. See, we've been taught that we got a physical body, emotional body, mental body, spiritual body, and we could go on and on. And again, that's language splitting it up. So as long as language is splitting it up, you and your mind is thinking that that's the part you have to work on next, and that's not true. You only got one body. I'm looking at your mental body, if we want to say that, or your physical body, your spiritual body. You're all one. And you got to start thinking in that unity mindset. Hmm. So as you're developing that unity mindset through meditation, that's going to start doing the work for you because that's the allowing. See, our thoughts are so powerful, it could block energy from allowing you to become one. Just by you thinking, you're working on something separate as being a mental body. But your mental body is you. It's your totality. I'm looking at it. Mm. This makes sense. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I have compartmentalized, uh, based on the various schools of thought, the different right. interpenetrating aspects, whether or not you know they're, they're separate. They've just been categorized separately. And I can see right. how that would create a mental division and uh, that could cause the body to not operate as a unity. So that's All interesting. All right, check this out. When you're meditating, the first thing you got to do is be relaxed. Mm -hmm. the, the physical body we can relate to, it needs to be in a relaxed position. Why? So that energy can pass through it more smoothly because it's a great conductor of energy. Mm -hmm. When the body's relaxed, it automatically takes you to the mind, the thoughts. And all meditation.
Meditation is basically telling you to observe the thoughts and just let them pass by. Why is that? Because as soon as you focus on a thought or give it energy, that's what creates your reality, and it has the power to block energy. So when you compartmentalize stuff, you just gave it power. Mm. Yeah. Wow. That's powerful. A thought is the first phase of physical matter. We ain't been looking at it like that, but it is. Mm. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah, those are valid points. Oh, Do you have any questions? A person starved to death. They're not unified. Uh-huh. Okay. A person that fasts. Fasting is different than living on planet. One has a unified, continual energy flow where it can go continually because it's unified. The other one just fasting, compartmentalizing with the language. I'm fasting for the physical body. I'm fasting for the mind. So it's mm -hmm. temporary. And they don't have enough energy that's flowing to unify them, so it only lasts for a temporary uh, period of time. But a person living on a planet is a unified being. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. They're one with the nature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you find as a, uh, having gone through this process, uh, that your spiritual, um, that your spiritual uh, experiences have increased, have become more intense as a result of this new allowing and the food not getting in the way? And, and how dramatically has that changed your uh, perception of reality? <laughs> Maybe than it used to be. Oh, actually, it made reality more simple. Oh. It didn't intensify nothing. The intensity took place in my spiritual walk when I was what? In other words, separated from nature. That's why everybody's having these radical spiritual experiences, because they're separated. When you start becoming unified, everything's become simple, and it becomes clear. So it's not no big event. Okay. So it's real, a reverse. It's a reverse. Okay. We're going back into our native state instead of... Can I ask a question about that? I have a million questions that I could ask you, and I don't want to take all the time, but it, my mind is blown to shreds, and I am so grateful to be part of this conversation. Thank you. Um, but I, just a specific question about that. So... Would you say that the experiences, these these grand experiences that, that some of us may or may not have, bring us back to, that, that those experiences themselves can actually lead us back to this simplicity that you're talking about? Exactly. That's what it should be designed to do. Okay. that's I love it. That's beautiful. <laughs> that's why you don't have to be stuck within the experience. It's all the experience, but there's a time you could drop it, let it go. But people get stuck into the experience uh, yes. and think it's real. And then that's where they become inner energy and get out of existence. Oh, that's so that. beautiful. And it makes perfect sense because letting go is such an important part of spiritual practice. Let Letting go of everything, our perceptions, our experiences, everything, you know, right. obviously materialism and things, you know, early on people talk about, you know, you have to let go of the idea that we, have ownership or that we possess these things, but, but you're saying even letting go of the very experiences that are leading us into a deeper spirituality. Exactly. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> because even this reality we live in or the experiences we uh, are talking about are nothing but an agreement people are making of an illusion. Hmm. Right. You can break that illusion. That's amazing. This is uh, such powerful stuff. And I have another question. Uh, and also in, in the process, please, you know, share whatever kind of uh, your URL, whatever your training course is, because there's going to be people who want to follow up on this. This instantly resonates. And uh, you're a master at this. So where should, would you direct them? Uh, I have a website, uh, elitomelamine.com. That's one word? That? That's yes, one word. E L I T O M E L A M I N. Eli Tom Ella El Amin. Okay. Yes. Okay. Dot com. And also, I have a YouTube channel 
where I try to answer as many questions as possible on the material I get, even dealing with the liquid journey and even dealing with how long it takes. I try to hit every subject to help people so they can understand what this process is about. Yeah, and I've seen a lot of your YouTube videos, and you have a very profound spiritual knowledge base, and it's so beautiful watching you and listening to you uh, teach everything you do. So uh, real quick, just to kind of bring it back a gradient for people who haven't uh, kind of caught up to where we're at or how, how we got to this place, uh, could you talk about what caused you to decide to become a breatharian and uh, where you were and kind of the process to getting to well, this? Back then on the level of thought I was on or consciousness I was under, I loved spirituality on anything that was out there at the time. However, the old faith spirituality did not focus what I was into, the physical body. The physical body meant nothing. Everybody was focusing on other places. But as my physical body began to take, get hurt and get going to pain, I knew that something's wrong. I got to figure something else out here. So I ran into other schools of thought dealing with the holistic knowledge mm -hmm. to start taking care of your physical body. Can't help nobody if your physical body's hurting. Wow. Mm -hmm. So as I came more and started seeing these health improvements take place, this is why this is a health message. You know, I began to lose weight, blood pressure going down, looking better, feeling better. All of this is living on prana. I just didn't know it back then. <laughs> so you're you're buff now. I've seen pictures of you. <laughs> You've got this muscle, and you know it's like it's like that one guy. Uh, uh, Jericho Sunfire, another breatharian, he's a bodybuilder, and I noticed you've been able to build up body mass, and you know, they say vegans can't do it, but here we got somebody who's breatharian. <laughs> now, check this out. I'm glad you said that. Now, right now, I'm like, what, 52, 53 kilos, which is 120 pounds? Now, back when I was 190 pounds, if I were to drop that weight right away, everybody, when I dropped weight, becoming a vegan at the time, People said I lost too much weight and I look sick because they were not used to seeing that new form. Right. Now I'm 120 pounds, which is like, what, 52 kilos? Now, right now you're looking at me as I'm buff because you got used to seeing me in this form. Does that make a sense? Okay. You got to get used to seeing the form from your reality. Mm. But before mm. then, if I drop too fast, too much weight, people will say you look sick. What's wrong? But when you, when you see me for a period of time, then I start looking, and of course I do exercises. That's part of the pranic journey. Push-ups. The less body fat, it's easy to cut your body up. It's easy for me to get a chest. It's easy for me to get muscles in the arms. And you don't need to work out every day. You don't got no body fat to go and get. When you got prana coming through the body, you got a lot more energy. The reason why you go to sleep is so you can regenerate your energy. You're tired. You're, you need to heal. But through meditation, you're, the reason why you know you're living on prana is because your sleep will decrease. You'll have a feeling of having more energy to do things. So if you've got all this energy on your hands, you should be have enough time to work out, and your body should look good. Wow. Yeah. It should look attractive being on this path. Why are we on it? We on it because it's a health message, a holistic health message. Amazing. You know, and I have found that especially when I'm going through streaks of, uh, of, of not eating, of not succumbing to the, you know, the temptations to eat for intellectual reasons, boredom is the number one thing. And I've heard a lot of breatharians bring that up. It's like, what do I do with all this time? And you think you just fill it doing with the same old kind of thing, but it really does kind of leave a void in the schedule that uh, you're unprepared right. to fill. When you answer the key question, you're not going to go back doing the same old thing. You're going. This is going to bring you into a whole new life. Hmm. Now you've got the time and energy to do those things you never thought you had the energy to do. And I'm going to really shoot straight from the hip. You're going to become from a homo sapien to a homo genius. You wow. will come with some ideas that's out of this world. You know why? Because even they say scientifically that your intestines or your colon is a brain. They tell you your heart is a brain, and when all of that is open, you will come with some ideas. 
It's some creative thought processes that will lead you into a whole new life. So not only you're attaching from food and becoming an alignment, it is going to bring you into a whole new creative cycle in life where you're going to create new things. So you got to get prepared for it. You ain't oh, going to do man. the same old thing. <laughs> oh, man, I love it. <laughs> This is so cool. <laughs> so a Adam and his wife own a vegan restaurant. I think it's about to become an oxygen bar. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a shot of air. A shot there, of air, yeah. Shots of air all around. We'll be doing some more breathing. <laughs> a focused breathing, yeah. Uh, so oh, so can you go into a little bit more detail about your your daily or over the 19 years? I know that some people think a breath of air never eats again. And breatharians, they can eat to enjoy here and there, but they're not dependent on it for any substantial nutrients or anything. Uh, right. And I know there's different levels of breatharians. There's level one, two, and you're like a level three, and each of these levels have, you know, varying degrees of, you know, non-food lifestyle or maybe, you know, wattitarian or liquidarian. So wh where are you at in your dietary journey? I'm at level three. That means I don't eat no physical food at all. It's due to the work I'm doing. My job right now is I'm educating humanity on this level, so of course I'm practicing what I preach. Mm. In other words, I'm the real deal, so the energy can come off of me. Mm -hmm. Now, there's many different levels, especially on my journey. And I tell people when you learn this message, it's for everybody. It ain't about you got to become completely food free. Because if you're raising a family, for instance, you got to think about how food brings the family together. However, you want to start taking this message on at least make sure your family is going into a healthy direction when they come together and eat. Don't overindulge those energies. You understand? Mm -hmm. And then as your family keeps growing, you know, as your kids get grown, depending on where you're at, then if you feel like backing up even more, uh, exploring consciousness, because this is what this is. Why would you want to not eat? You're exploring consciousness. Consciousness is more just in your head. It's your physical body, and it's also this reality that we live in. You will start having access to information, access to things where not, no longer be mythical, where all your needs in, in life will be met. Uh-oh, did I say that? Yes, oh. I did, because you're unified. <laughs> now, <laughs> so, we're going to my personal journey. I had to think at first or when to apply this ability or when not to. Because you don't always have to put yourself into a corner. And that's what a lot of people expect of a breath they're in. You, you know, you can go for a long time. As soon as you eat something, see, I told you you need to eat something. You don't need to get into that. You still have the ability to eat, experience, and enjoy if you want to. So now, now that you got that power picked up, like I said, your health should be in it. All the way. That's the main message of this whole thing. So what I did is, as my son was growing up, I chose to eat with him every other weekend to enjoy those times together. Mm -hmm. Now, keep in mind, that's still unbelievable to eat every other weekend. You understand? <laughs> that's still <laughs> all time. Yeah. Can, right. So this is what I try to get in people's head. Don't expect that you got to say, oh, I can never eat again. You know, put tears in your eyes. Now, as time <laughs> develops, my next decision to go totally food-free is because I want a new experience to experience the reality that I'm talking about, the unified consciousness. And it's great when you can actually, instead of it being talk, everything is me, now you're having the experience to really know this is true. And that's why you don't have to what? It helps the mind taking away the fear-based frequency. You're off the survival level. You got all your needs met. You're creating from thought without uh, putting in a whole lot of effort because the energy is radiating off of you. This isn't magic. This isn't far-fetched. We read it in books, but you are that being living in this realm of energy that we live in. Wow. That's beautiful. So beautiful. So amazing. Does anybody else in the room here have any questions? Can, can I ask what may seem like uh, too practical of a question at this point with, with everything you've shared so far? But uh, just out of my own curiosity and maybe the curiosity of a lot of listeners, how long have you been food free? I've been on a path for 19 years. Now, the last physical meal I had was 2017 of October, and that was a meal that I had with my son 
as he was leaving from Europe back to America. But even before then, when we had that um, uh, that meal together, I was food free for a great period of time. Wow. So like I said, you can pick and choose when you want to. We got that power. See, it's about taking back control of mind over matter. Yeah. You should run your body because it's a vehicle. It shouldn't be driving you around. Mm. You should be able to park it, tell it what to do, instead of it saying you can't control it. And that's what you're coming <laughs> back right. into into the driver's seat. <laughs> I love it. That's awesome. <laughs> so awesome. Well, I mean, I think you've hit on... Uh, is there anything else that you want to uh, talk about? I had some questions, but I feel like just going off-road because well, you're talking about everything. I'll add this one in so it won't be mythical. Right now when you eat food, that is dead plants and animals just like fossil fuels that we run most cars off of. Now we're in an age you can run cars off electricity, you can run it off of solar power, you can run it off of nuclear power, we can go on and on. That's what you're doing with this human vehicle. This is a bio machine that we're living in. All you're doing is changing from one fuel source of fossil fuels to another fuel source. That's why this is a, a process. You have to give your body time to make that shift. In other words, you're becoming from an earth animal of eating what dead plants and animals to an air animal. Your lungs is going to become your primary digestive system. Your intestines is going to become your secondary. For a food eater, their intestines is their primary digestive, and their lungs is their secondary. So there's a shift that must take place on your fuel source, and once you get that maintained through meditation, this is when this will start becoming a reality. So take your time and stay consistent in a meditation where you can start working on energy flow. We all have an electromagnetic field around us, what we call our aura. It changes all the time for everything we put in our body, everything we think. It's uh, the person's responsibility to keep it open, to keep it flowing. And once they learn that, this is why this is a lifestyle. You have to do it continually if you want to reap these benefits. Yes. And uh, another question real quick is, what is the end goal of your teachings? Is there uh, to lead people to the breatharian movement, to lead people into a specific state of consciousness? Oh, how would you concisely? Oh, you, you just basically answered both of them. Uh, a specific state of consciousness is basically is educating humanity that this unified consciousness we're talking about exists and it could be manifested. Now, I'm not trying to lead all of humanity to food freedom, but one thing for sure in this dispensation of time, all of humanity is going to know that it exists. Yeah. That's really... It's like everybody knows there's a vegetarian now. Yeah. There's no argument. There was a time there was an argument. Now that's over. Now we got veganism. Now it's going to be the same <laughs> with vegetarianism. You're going to know it exists, and the argument's going to be over. Wow. Yeah, that's really beautiful. And I have one more question uh, before we end off our interview here, and that pertains to the source of the prana, the sunlight. Uh, you know, some understand that the the sun is the physical manifestation of the Christ depending on, you know, the tradition you come from. Uh, what is the sun to you, spiritually speaking, in its rays? Well, from an external point of view of where we're standing, that the sun is the biggest energy source external from us, hands down, no matter where you live on this planet. It's affecting us directly or indirectly. Dealing with our livestock, the food people are already eating, it's affecting everything. So utilizing that force, that is free energy that everybody has access to. Now what that means also is, let's say if you're living in a climate where the sun is not out that much, that's what people start talking about. That don't mean nothing. Everything has an electromagnetic field, even our physical bodies. But even the sun has an electromagnetic field, and we're living in an electromagnetic field of the sun. Everywhere you go, it don't matter if it's wintertime, nighttime, you're still living in that field, so therefore you can utilize that energy again through meditation. We're constantly being bombarded by the cosmic energies that's coming uh, from off of Earth. And they're bombarding us all the time, and our body is good conductors of energy. So when you know how, this is what it deals with. 
The cosmic energy is doing its part. The solar energy is doing its part. It's radiating the planet. Now all a human being needs is self-knowledge. Cosmic energy and self-knowledge, that's what it's all about. When you don't have self-knowledge, you don't know how to use the free energy. You don't know how to work the vehicle that you live in. Now, in an internal level, the greatest energy source you have is your sexual energy down in your first chakra. That energy must rise upwards. That's why we say all the ancient symbolisms got the serpent coming up the pole. You got the caduceus in the medical field. You got the, uh, what, kudalini in India. In Egypt, you got the serpent coming from the pharaoh's head. That serpent energy that's coming from the first chakra, that sexual energy, must rise upwards with no uh, obstacles, and you will have guaranteed health, life, and well-being. That's such an amazing point to end off on because that's a very profound point, and we will be unpacking it, I'm sure, for weeks. So, yeah, for sure. Well, Ellie, Tom, <laughs> Elamine, I appreciate your time here today. I'm going to link all of your contact information on the New, Pre uh, uh, the New Precept uh, Facebook page and also the Spiritual Realities uh, Facebook page so people can follow you and get into your material. And I thank you so much. I think you are a holy man uh, walking amongst us. Absolutely. And you are uh, so amazing. I'm so blessed and honored that uh, you're here with us today. In the midst of, you're training a course right now. You got a lot of people there uh, right. for a re so. Uh, so anyway, uh, we're gonna let you go, and uh, thank you very much for being here. And hopefully, we'll talk to you again in the future. All right, thank you. Y'all have a nice day. Okay, thank you, you too. Tommy. Thanks, Tommy. All right, all right, bye. Bye bye. You got two minutes. Okay. Two minutes. Two minutes. So at the bottom of the page. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. Oops. I'm just all in the camera. All right. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, next week, we're going to be uh, discussing... Uh, topics including the Course in Miracles and the Impersonal Life, which is actually Elvis Presley's favorite book, if you didn't know that. He used to take it around to his concerts and hand it out. The Impersonal Life, very profound uh, Christian mysticism. And we'll talk a little bit about the Christian Apocrypha. You, cool. ever, you ever heard of any of that? Actually, I have, yeah. Yeah, I have. I've, I've heard about um, Elvis's Fascination with, with Christian mysticism and, and the impersonal life. Yeah, and that book. Yeah, it's absolutely. a very small book, yeah. uh, but it's very profound. Uh, so, yeah, can't wait to talk to you more about that. Meanwhile, uh, join us on uh, the Spiritual Realities Facebook page. Uh, you can search at Spiritual Realities on Facebook, like and follow us. Uh, you can email me with any suggestions if you uh, want to support the show or be part of uh, that process at Robert at NewPrecept.com. You'll find us on Spotify, the podcast there. Uh, we're on Podbean, Twitter, uh, at Spirit Realities. Adam, where are we going to find you? Cool. The work that I do in the world, uh, my wife and I own a vegan cafe here in Memphis called Imagine Vegan Cafe. You can find us at imagineveganCafe.com. Uh, we also make music, um, and our music is under the name Three Day Flight. We're a musical collective. Um, and we would love for you to listen to our music at 3dayflight.com. We're also on Twitter, uh, Spotify, Facebook. Uh, just look us up and find us. Okay. Thanks. If you have any suggestions, give me an email. Talk to you next time. CBS News at the top of every hour. Serving Tennessee, Mississippi, and Arkansas. This is the Voice KWAM Memphis.